Hi, everyone, and welcome to Topic 22 Podcast. This is Mrs. Campbell speaking, and in this podcast, we're just going to review some of the topics from Topic 22. Um, This whole topic is about trig identities, and of course, you need to know some of the basic identities. I'm not going to write all of them down, but you do have a sheet that has the reciprocal identities on it. You should have one that has the quotient identities on it, the odd and even identities, and the cofunction identities. So you certainly have all of those. We'll, in addition to that, review the Pythagorean identities and where they come from, and then, of course, we'll practice using them as we're doing some simplifying. We'll start today, though, with the guidelines for simplifying. So you might remember, as we've discussed in the lessons, what the guidelines are. The very first guideline, the kind of the typical things that people try when they're doing some simplifying, the first thing that you might think about is rewriting everything in terms of sines and cosines. So I'm going to say guideline number one, write in sines and cosines. So for example, if you saw tangent, you would write that as a sine over cosine an example. So you might look for that. I would say look for, in the second thing, these are things to try, look for Pythagorean identities. We'll write those down in just a minute, but essentially if you see a trig function squared, you're probably going to use a Pythagorean identity. So look for opportunities to use those. Uh, For number three, you might look for um, the adding of fractions, getting in common denominators and things like that. Along with that, you would have any factoring. Those are kind of just like your typical algebraic things that you do. So adding fractions, getting common denominators, and so on. And then finally, and really the most important one, so I'm going to put an asterisk here or a star, and the most important one would be to try something. There's always something you can do, and and sometimes just trying something, writing one thing, might lead to another and lead to another and so on. Um, try something that is a legal or legitimate thing to do, so make sure you know your identities in order to do that. Now, let's just review what the big ones are, the Pythagorean identities. Those are the most important ones to know, um, and they are this. Well, the first one is the sine of theta squared plus the cosine of theta squared equals one. Most people know that one. That one's the most obvious one, but there are other two are can also be very useful and good to know. Um, to find those, to be honest, I only memorize that first one, and then I just figure out the other ones whenever I need them. So if I think that I'm going to need one that has tangent or cotangent in it, then I just kind of take that first one and figure them out. I usually also write them down right away when I get my test. It's like the first thing I write down so that I have a reference to them. To find the other ones, I will take the sine, the cosine, and the 1 and divide everything by sine squared theta. When I do that, sine squared divided by sine squared, well, that's 1. And cosine divided by sine is cotangent. If they're squared, it will be cotangent squared. And then 1 divided by sine is cosecant. And if it's squared, it will be cosecant squared. So that's a Pythagorean identity. I'll use it, or I'll figure that one out, and then I'll look for it in my problems when I see something squared. I could also take that original one, go back to that, divide everything by cosine squared. And when I do, I'll get sine over cosine, that's tangent, and since they're both squared, that's tangent squared. And then cosine over cosine is 1, squared is still 1, and 1 over cosine is secant. You know, of course, you have to know those reciprocal identities in order to know those. So that's why those other identities are really important. So I'm going to use now the strategies that we've outlined above and probably the Pythagoreans to do some simplifying or verifying. That's what this unit is all about. So for the first one, the first thing I see is the cosecant of pi over 2 minus theta, and I think about the cofunctions. And remember, cofunctions is short for complementary functions. And it's complementary because pi over 2, which is like 90, and theta are going to be complementary angles. They add up to 90. So I want the complementary function to cosecant. The complement of cosecant is secant. 
So cosecant of pi over 2 minus theta is the secant of theta. I made that substitution. And then for the other part, I'll just rewrite it for now. So use your little substitutions. You know, like in the next one, I've got negative r's. In this one, I have a complementary angles. You know, I'm looking for those kinds of things. The next thing that I'm probably going to do is, you know, going back to my identities up at the top, my, my list of things to try, um, I could write everything in sine and cosine, and I think I'll do that. So secant is 1 over cosine. And cosecant is 1 over sine. And sine is already in terms of sine. I'm writing it as sine over 1 just to remember that it's a fraction. Now, I've got a couple of options at this point. You can kind of decide which way you want to go. One of the options would be to work inside the parentheses and simplify inside there and then multiply by cosine. Or option number two would be to distribute and then get the common denominator and so on. I honestly have no idea what the best option is, so I'm just going to try something because that's what number four says to do. I think I'll do the distributing. So the first fraction will be 1 times 1, that's 1, and then I'll have a cosine and a sine. And then minus, the second fraction is going to be 1 times sine, that's sine, and in the bottom, cosine times 1 is cosine. Okay, now, did that get me anywhere? Well, it got me somewhere, and the next thing I'm going to look at, again, considering my my um, things I have written at the top here are these guidelines. The third guideline says, you know, add fractions. Well, I've got fractions here, guys, but there's no common denominator. I'll need to get that. So to get that common denominator, I'll take that second fraction and multiply it by sine over sine. So that I'll get, when I add my fractions together now, the numerators will be 1 minus sine times sine. That's sine squared. In the denominator, I'll have cosine sine. Now, I do want to point out, as you probably have noticed, that I often am not saying the theta, but I write it every single time. The argument theta is super important. You do need to write that down every single time. I should technically say it every single time as well. Um, so as I continue, I'm like, what can I do next? Well, I look at the sine squared and I think about the Pythagorean. So I go back up here and I'm looking at this one. And I'm looking at, I've got the 1, that's right here. If I took this sign and put it on the other side, that would be 1 minus sine squared. What would be left would be cosine squared. That's a Pythagorean substitution. And like I said, we use those all the time. That's going to be cosine squared theta over cosine theta sine theta. And finally, again, all the algebraic steps I had can use, I can still use. I've got two factors of cosine in the numerator, one in the denominator. I can cancel one of those out. So I'm going to cancel one of those out. The top will have left a cosine. The bottom will have left a sine. And that is one of our quotient identities. That is cotangent theta. So I'm done. Now how do I know I'm done? Kind of the general rules are try to get a single fun trig function instead of more than one. So cosine and sine was two, cotangent is just one. Make sure everything's reduced as much as possible. And I think we're good to go on this one, guys. All right now, I don't know if it was the best way to go. Doesn't even matter. You just do things until you can get to something that looks simpler. And in this particular case, I did write everything in sines and cosines. I did use Pythagorean identities. I did add fractions. I did try something. I did all of those guidelines, um, which just means it's a good problem. It's kind of got everything in it. All right, in question number two, I'm going to continue on. And again, it's a simplify problem. So as I look at that one, it says 1 plus tan squared r over secant negative r cosecant negative r. First thing I'm thinking about, I see that squared, and I think, gosh, I bet that's Pythagorean identity. Look at number three up there, tangent squared plus 1. Well, this is 1 plus tangent squared. That's the same thing, though. Um, that's going to simplify to secant squared. Now, this variable is r, so I'm going to write secant squared r. Now, you know that I'm the kind of person that's going to mark it wrong if you don't write the r. So please do that. And then I got the odd even identities here for the next part with the negative r. So I'm going to deal with that. Secant comes from cosine, and cosine is an even function. And so secant will also be an even function. And what that means is that this denominator, secant negative r, is going to be the same as just secant r. Cosecant comes from sine. Sine is an odd function. And when you have an odd function, 
um, it's going to be a negative value, and so this will be the negative cosecant of r. Now, where do I go from there? Gosh, I don't know, but I do see something, and I'm going to try something, of course. I see that I've got a secant on the top and on the bottom. In fact, two in the top and one in the bottom. I'm going to cancel one of them out. That's going to leave me with secant r, just one in the top, in the bottom, cosecant r, and then there's also going to be a negative. Now, the negative is currently in the bottom. I'm just going to put it on the outside of the fraction, and then I'm going to keep going from there. So what other options do I have? Well, I don't have anything squared, so I'm not thinking about Pythagoreans. I already did that, in fact. I don't really have fractions to add, so I'm not thinking about that. But I haven't yet written them in sines and cosines, so I think I'll do that. So what I have in the top of the fraction is secant. That's 1 over cosine. In the bottom, I have cosecant. That's 1 over sine. Again, it's really important that you know your identities. And now I have a fraction divided by a fraction. And we know that to divide fractions, you take the numerator, which is 1 over cosine, and multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator, which will become sine over 1. And that's going to end up being negative sine um, over cosine, which is, of course, tangent, and it's negative. And that is a single fraction, reduced as much as possible, so looks like it's done. All right, let's go on to our next page. Remember the Pythagoreans we wrote? Take a look in particular at this one. I have 1 minus sine squared. That's going to be cosine. So I'm going to go back and replace that with over here. And here's the one I'm looking at. This is the one that's got the tangent, and I know that tangent plus 1 is secant squared. So when I follow these guidelines, I look at the guidelines and I think, well, do I have anything squared? Can I go to sines and cosines? What if I got a common denominator? Again, you try something and you see what happens. Usually one step will take you to another and hopefully eventually you'll get there. Now, along with these identities, these Pythagorean identities, there is that other list of co-function identities like this one. We needed to know that that was secant. Like even odd identities like these guys, we had to know whether these were going to be positive or negative. There are other ones that we have to know, like you have to know that sine over cosine is tangent. You have to know that cosine over sine is cotangent. There are just all of those things that you have to know in order to know what things to try. So practice with those a little bit more. Good luck on your test, everybody. We'll see you next time. All right, let's take a look at question number three. Now, I do want you to note that the instructions for number three have changed a little bit. It doesn't just say simplify, it says verify. That means that, well, it means a couple of things. Number one, it means you know what you're supposed to get when you're all done. Then the left-hand side has to become the right-hand side or the other way around. I typically make the left become the right. Um, and secondly, just what your answer is is not your only answer. It's all the work that gets you that answer that is important. So let's take a look at question number three. My instinct is saying work on the left-hand side. That's what I'm going to do. I look at it right now and I think about my guidelines and I certainly don't have anything squared, so I'm not thinking about Pythagoreans. I don't have any fractions, so I'm not thinking about getting common denominators. I am, however, thinking about going to sines and cosines. So I'm going to begin by changing the cosecant to 1 over sine. Now the sine is just the sine. It's already in terms of sine, but I think I might write it as over 1 just to remind myself that it really is a fraction. And then I now I'm thinking about common denominators. So here's what I'm thinking. Sine t over 1 would need to have a denominator of sine. So I'm going to multiply by sine over sine. That's a giant one, folks. And the top will become 1 minus sine squared t. And all of that is going to be over sine t. Now I'm back to thinking about the Pythagorean. So I'm going to go back a page here, cosine. So this will become cosine squared t over sine t. All right, now it looks a little better already, but you know, it doesn't really look like my answer. I have to get it to equal this cosine t cotangent t. Now, the nice news is that I know what it's supposed to equal, so I'll know if I did it right or not. 
but the bad news is I got to get there. So looking at the right hand side, and I can't work on the right hand side, but I can think about it. So in my brain here, so I'm not writing anything. It's not part of my problem, but I'm thinking about, so these are my little thought bubbles. I'm thinking cosine and then cotangent is cosine over sine. Well, don't I kind of have that? I mean, I have cosine squared, which isn't that really just cosine times cosine. And I have the sine in the bottom, so I kind of already have that. I just have to write it. So writing it, I'm going to say, well, cosine squared t is cosine t times cosine t. And the sine in the bottom, because it's multiplication in the top, only really applies to one of those things. So I'll just put it here, sine t. And then I can write cosine t cotangent Ugh, I almost wrote an X, T, and that is exactly what I was trying to get, and I'm super excited about that, so I'm going to go, woo-hoo, there's my proof. couple of things to note, really, really careful, guys. Step one, step two, step three, step four, they have to be written as a vertical column, and they have to be logical steps, like I have to know where it came from, so we can't just do random stuff and end up with the answer. Your work is the answer. Your work has to be shown in a very specific way. Now, I bet you are all ready for the next one. So let me think about this one. I think this is our last one. So, and I'm looking at number four. There are two options. I'm wondering what you're thinking of for options. Option number one would be to go to sines and cosines because we got tangents and secants all over the place. That's an option. Option number two would be to get a common denominator. So which one would you do? Well, I'm kind of hoping you're thinking like me. I'm thinking about getting a common denominator. I am not thinking about going to sines and cosines. The reason why I'm not is because my fractions would become complex fractions. I'd have one plus one over cosine over sine over cosine, and then the second fraction would be sine over cosine over one plus one. I mean, that would be a mess. I think getting a common denominator first might be easier. The common denominator here is tangent m, 1 plus secant m, which means the first fraction is missing the 1 plus secant m, top and bottom. And when you multiply that, you do have to FOIL, multiply it out, so you get 1 plus 2 secant m plus secant squared m. That's first fraction. Second fraction it's missing the tangent, so I'm going to multiply that by tangent over tangent, tangent m over tangent m, and that will give me tangent squared m. Now, in thinking a little bit further about this, I see some squared things, and I'm thinking, I know secant and tangent are connected via uh, Pythagorean, but I can never remember exactly what that rule is. That's why I write it down right away at the beginning. So I'm going to just go over here, and I go, Tangent plus 1 is secant squared. I look at this and I go, well, here's the 1, and here's the tangent squared. Those two things added together, that's secant squared. So I'm going to write that down. I'll write that secant squared plus 2 secant plus another secant squared. Again, I'm doing it where I'm not saying the M, but I'm writing it because I need to. All over tangent m multiplied by 1 plus secant m. Now that didn't seem super useful except that now everything at least I've got lots of secants here. You might have noticed and I would normally not even have written this step but I wanted to be sure that you saw it. This and this those are like terms. I'm putting them together. So I'll have 2 secant squared m plus 2 secant m over tan m times 1 plus secant m. Now, I hope I'm not giving you a false sense of, well, I know what to do, I know what to do, because nobody does. I mean, you're not alone when you're like, I don't know what the next step is going to be. So again, that, step, that fourth step of try something is really, really important. I don't know what to try either, but I'm looking at the top and I'm seeing two secant m's on both of those terms. I'm thinking about factoring it out. We'll see where that takes me. Maybe it'll take me nowhere. I don't know. Never know until you try, right? So 2 secant m times the quantity secant m plus 1. Now you tell me.
Do you see anything extra special happening? I do, and I would never have seen it if I didn't try something. I see in the numerator secant m plus 1, in the denominator 1 plus secant m. Folks, those are exactly the same. So I'm going to cancel them out. So now what remains is 2 secant over tangent, and I am kind of stuck. If you go back and look at the answer, it's like, well, the 2 is there. That's about it. Now is a time where maybe it would be not such a big deal to write it in terms of sines and cosines. So since secant is 1 over cosine, 2 secant would be 2 over cosine. Sorry, I switched colors and didn't realize it till now. The bottom, tangent, well, that's sine over cosine. And again, I am writing the variable every time. I'm out of room, and I hate it when that happens because I make a big deal about it. You have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. When I run out of room, and you might end up running out of room at some point as well, I'm going to draw an arrow to the right just to indicate that my next step is going to be 2 over cosine multiplied by the reciprocal of the bottom, which is going to be then cosine over sine. Oh, guys, isn't this gorgeous? Look at that. Cosines are gone. What have I left? I have 2 over sine left. What was I trying to get? I was trying to get 2 cosecant. Well, cosecant is 1 over sine, so 2 over sine is 2 cosecant, and that is exactly what I was trying to get. Super happy about that, guys. We have exactly what we want, and we have completed it. Now, in the end, let me just share something with you as you're going into either taking a test or taking a retake. You don't always know what to do, right? I didn't know what to do either. 